speakers, and today we're covering um, CNS or central nervous system. This is part two of um, the video lecture. Now, I want to remind you that central nervous system is made of brain and spinal cord, and I cover structure of human brain in my first lecture, and I will leave a um, link to that lecture in the description section. But today, we're going to cover spinal cords. That's why I'm going to scroll down and find that slide where we stopped right here, spinal cord. So let's go ahead and begin. Location. Spinal cord begins at the foramen magnum. Remember, that's a big opening inferior on your skull. And it ends as conus medullaris at L1 vertebra. L1 is lumbar one. You know, we have five lumbar vertebra. So your spinal cord, it is shorter than your vertebral column because you have five lumbar, you have sacrum and coccyx and a conus medullaris that is actually this structure right here. It ends at level L1. After that, you have what's shown here in a uh, green color. This is phylum terminale, that is fibrous extension. So it's not nervous tissue, it's a connective tissue. Fibrous extension from conus medullaris that anchors the spinal cord to the coccyx, right there. Functions. Spinal cord provides two-way communication to and from the brain and contains spinal reflex centers. Also, um, I want you to look at this diagram and, and see that you have several what we call enlargements. So here's a um, cervical enlargement and nerves that innervate your upper limbs will branch from cervical enlargement and then you have a lumbar enlargement where you have uh, nerves that uh, innervates your lower limbs. They branch from this uh, lumbar enlargement. Uh, also, those lines shown that emerge from a spinal cord, those are nerves, spinal nerves. So in the cervical region, you have cervical spinal nerves, in the thoracic, thoracic spinal nerves, in the lumbar, lumbar, and sacral spinal nerves. Now, spinal nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system. So I'm not going to cover them in this chapter, but I will have another video lecture when we'll talk about um, spinal and cranial nerves. Also at the end of spinal cord, so here's our conus medullaris, and then you have the whole bunch of spinal nerves that form structure called uh, coda inguina. Okay, spinal cord consists of five regions and 31 segments. Five regions, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, uh, sacral, and coccygeal. And 31 segments correspond with 31 spinal nerves. So one nerve, uh, well, from one segment, you have two nerves, right? Right and left nerve that emerges from each segment. Protection of the spinal cord. What protects it? Bone meninges and cerebrospinal fluid. Um, cushion of pet and a network of veins in the epidural space between the vertebra and spinal dura matter and cerebrospinal fluid in subarachnoid space. So let's look at uh, spinal cord. So here's the spinal cord inside vertebral cavity. Now this, this is bone, that's your vertebra. And um, so here's our dura mater. So it's two, it's always two layers. Um, now, just below, uh, between these two layers, we have epidural space with uh, blood vessels. When somebody get epidural, this is where they inject the um, 
medications. Then we have arachnoid. Underneath arachnoid is subarachnoid space with cerebrospinal fluid and covering um, the nervous, the cord itself, spinal cord is pia matter. Okay. Uh, spinal nerves, we have 31 pairs, cervical and lumbar enlargement. This is where um, those nerve, uh, nerves that uh, innervate your upper and lower limb emerges. And coda guina, as I already mentioned, is a collection of nerve roots at the inferior end of the vertebral uh, column. So you can see this uh, inferior part. So the spinal uh, cord ends and those are nerves. And remember, spinal cord is part of central nervous system and nerves, that means coda inguina, that means horse tail, a part of peripheral nervous system because this, this is not spinal cord, those are nerves. All right, so that's our anatomy of the uh, cross section, uh, anatomy of the spinal cord and specifically a cross section. So let's see what we have. Um, so we see several segments. So actually one, two, three segments. Uh, covering by uh, dura matter, then we have arachnoid matter, and then pia matter, enhanced to the uh, nervous tissue. Now, from each segment, I told you we have a spinal nerve. So this is a spinal nerve, this is a spinal nerve, and this structure are called roots of spinal nerve. Now, this is anterior. So this one is anterior or ventral root, and that one is posterior or dorsal root. In a dorsal root, you have this wide area called dorsal root ganglion. Right, then two roots unite to form spinal nerve. Um, you see blood vessels over here that supply oxygen and nutrients to um, your cord, spinal cord, and remove waste product. Now, if you look at this cross section, you can see in the middle is central canal with cerebrospinal fluid. Anteriorly, you have ventral median fissure. And on the back, dorsal median sulcus. Sulcus is smaller than fissure. And that's a gray matter, look like a butterfly, and white matter surrounding gray matter. Now, what connects this gray matter together called gray commissure? Now, gray matter has a dorsal horn, a ventral horn. And in the thoracic area, you also have a lateral horn. So we have, remember, we have roots, dorsal root, ventral root of the spinal nerve, and gray matter has horns. So dorsal horn, vent, ventral horn, and lateral horn. Okay, so that's, we just, oops, sorry, describe what we already saw. Um, so cross-section anatomy, two pairs of nerve roots extend from each segment of the spinal cord. The ventral roots or anterior roots allow motor neurons to exit the spinal cord. So fr uh, on front, in those roots, you have motor neurons. The dorsal roots or posterior roots allow sensory neurons to enter the spinal cord. Dorsal root ganglia contains cell bodies of sensory neurons. So that picture explains it even better. So again, cross section of the spinal cord, that's our horn, dorsal horn and ventral horn. And this is dorsal root, dorsal root ganglia, ventral root, and when they come together, they form spinal nerve. Now, you see how this 
neurons shown in blue, green, yellow, and red. Now, blue and green are sensory neurons. So sensory information, like, for example, somebody touching your uh, hand, right? So then you have this somatic sensory neuron, and this sensation of touch moves to the, um, this ganglion. This is where you have cell body of sensory neuron, and then to the spinal cord. Now, this green one is visceral sensory neuron. So, for example, you know, you feel like, uh, you know, some visceral pain, like your stomach hurts. Then this pain sensation will move right there to the dorsal root ganglion and to the spinal cord. Now, in the spinal cord, sensory neurons, synapses with interneurons, so those shown in green, uh, and blue, so the, just there is a synapsis. So uh, somatic sensory and visceral sensory. And then they synapse with motor neuron. Now this one, the red one, is your somatic motor neuron. So this innervates your, your muscles, sorry, your skeletal muscles. And the yellow one, visceral motor neuron, innervates uh, your smooth muscles, your uh, uh, also a glands in your skin, right? Something that you cannot control. Okay, so that's a very brief overview of spinal cord uh, structure and a little bit of the spinal nerves. Now, so that was the gray matter. Remember, there's our dorsal, ventral horns, but we also have white matter. Now, on this diagram, white matter is divided into some blue parts and red parts. Why? Because blue parts are ascending trucks. That means that sensory information goes up through these parts that colored in blue. So ascending trucks carry sensory information to the brain. And what you see in red, those are descending tracts from the brain to the periphery, from the brain to your muscles. What kind of information you carry? Motor information. So they carry motor commands from the brain. And um, we have some, um, we call it columns. So we have posterior columns, anterior columns, and lateral columns. Right. And all this. Uh, tract, they have name, like for example, spina cerebellar tract, um, from dorsal spina uh, cerebellar. So it's go from spinal cord to, to cerebrum. Uh, I'm sorry, to the cerebellum, right? Uh, or uh, spinothalamic, go to the spinal cord, to the thalamus, and then to the cerebrum or dorsal white column, fasciculus cuneatus, or fasciculus gra uh, gracilis, right, from the spinal cord goes to the cerebrum. So is it, you go to the cerebrum, to the to cerebellum, or to the thalamus, but that's all sensory information. And those descending tract, uh, reticular uh, spinal tract, or rubrospinal, or corticospinal, now from, uh, cortex of the cerebrum to your spine. So that goes down and then to your muscles. So here's a little bit about ascending pathways. Two pathways transmit somatosensory information to the sensory cortex via the thalamus. Uh, so where those pathways are? Again, those pathways are inside uh, your spinal cord in a white matter, shown here in the blue colors, right? So a spinothalamic or dorsal white column, for example. So here's our dorsal column, medial lemniscus pathway. That's, that's a, you know, that's a name. Uh, transmit 
input to the somatosensory cortex for discriminative touch and vibration. So if, if somebody touches you, right, or you feel vibration with your skin, for example, this information goes to your brain through the dorsal column, medial lemniscus pathway. That is right there, dorsal column, um, uh, dorsal white column. So it's all on the back over here. Now, you have also a spinal thalamic pathway. So let's go back. So spinal thalamic is right here. So that's our lateral spinal thalamic. And here, blue one is ventral spinal thalamic. Now this one, lateral and ventral spinal thalamic tract transmit pain, temperature, and coarse touch impulses within the lateral spinal thalamic tract. So discriminative touch means, well, let's say if somebody touches you with two fingers and you can identify, yeah, two fingers touching me. Coarse touch when you really cannot tell uh, is somebody touching you with one finger, with two, with five, that's more like um, in general, general touch. But spinal thalamic is important because it's for pain and temperature. Now, why it's important to know, because if there is some lesions within the spinal cord and a patient, for example, cannot feel pain or temperature, then we, we know that it's probably spinal thalamic tract is damaged, not the dorsal column. Spinal cerebellum tract terminates in cerebellum and conveys information about muscle or tendon stretch to the cerebellum. This one is um, right here, uh, spina, cerebella, ventral, and dorsal. So that's for cerebellum. Um, this is for our uh, touch and vibration. And uh, kind of anteriorly here and here, that's for pain and temperature. So again, um, discriminative touch and vibration. Uh, this is to cerebellum. And um, this one, spinothalamic about pain and temperature. And of course, if you, if you go to the cerebellum, then it's about your muscle and tendons, information about your muscle and tendon, because cerebellum is for uh, posture, balance, walking, riding your bike. And yeah, don't take me wrong, cerebellum has other function. Like for example, if you, um, if you put puzzles together, they believe that cerebellum is also help you to do that task. All right, so now how exactly the information is carried up and down. So for example, we see um, here, dorsal column, medial lemniscus pathway. Um, so that's our dorsal column for touch. Uh, so here, somebody touching your foot. Or somebody over here maybe, um, Maybe you feel like stretch in your hand, or if even let's say somebody touches your hand. Now here's your first neuron, right? And this is called first order neuron. It goes from your skin uh, to your spinal cord, and let's start moving up, right? So it's moving up, up, up. So over here also that's your first order neuron, and it start moving up, up, up and it reaches your medulla oblongata. In the medulla oblongata, it synapses with second order neurons. So here, let's go back here. Now, what else happened in the medulla? Look, it crosses. So if somebody touches your left uh, foot or arm, then in the medulla, information crosses to the right side of the brain, right? And then, from medulla, we continue moving, moving where? To the thalamus, because all sensory information goes to thalamus first. In the thalamus, it synapses with the third order neuron and it reaches your cortex. And now this is where you understand, well, somebody touching me or I have my uh, muscles stretched. Um, and of course, um, 
the spinal cerebellar goes from your muscles. Oh, um, so it goes to the spinal cord and it moves up, 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 and then it terminates into cerebellum. Spinothalamic tract um, was similar. Remember, spinothalamic is about temperature and pain. So again, temperature and pain, a first order neuron to the spinal cord. The difference is immediately, um, so it doesn't move to medulla, but right there on the level of entry, it synapses with the second order neuron and second order neuron crosses to the opposite side and moving up. So crosses to the opposite, moving up, goes to the um, medulla, goes to the pons, goes to the midbrain, and again to the thalamus. And the thalamus synapses with third order neuron and to your sensory cortex. And this is where you feel temperature or pain. Right? Now descending pathway and tracts. So now we go down, deliver, efferent impulses from the brain to the spinal cord. And efferent means they go down. Uh, we have direct pathway, pyramidal tract, regulates fast and fine movement, skilled movement, and indirect pathway, extra pyramidal, it's all other tracts that regulates XL muscles that maintain balance and posture, muscles controlling coarse movement, movement head, neck, and eye movements that follow object. So direct pathway, it's really kind of like very fine movements, movements that allow lots of skills. Uh, like, for example, if you move your fingers, that's going to be through pyramidal tract. But if you maintain your balance and posture, sometimes you don't even think about it. It just, uh, you automatically do it. Uh, or your coarse movement of the torso, or when you follow object, this is also almost like a, a reflex. That's extrapyramidal tract. Now let's see how extrapyramidal uh, and uh, pyramidal and extrapyramidal tract works. So here's your pyramidal tract, lateral and ventral, corticospinal. So you go from cortex to spinal cord. So here you have your motor uh, area you generate a movement. So you're like, okay, I'm gonna move my fingers. So you have your first order neuron that goes down, 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 down to the uh, medulla oblongata. And in the medulla oblongata, um, anterior part over here, you have pyramids. Pyramids of medulla oblongata, right? So you go um, through the pyramids, you go to the uh, cervical spinal cord, and whatever you need, for example, you need to move your toes and you need to go to lumbar, right? Um, and over here, you uh, cross over and synapse with another motor neuron. So we call it upper motor neuron and we call this one low motor neuron. So we have only two motor neurons over here, upper and low motor neurons. Now, if it's extra pyramidal tract, um, oh, here it's another uh, 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 pyramidal tract. So either it can decussate at the level of the spinal cord that um, the nerve branches from, or at the uh, pyramid. So uh, you know, just uh, in the medulla. But you always decussate. So you go from left to right. So for, that means if you want to move your left toe, that uh, signal originates in the right hemisphere. So in the right hemisphere, you originate nerve impulse that will move all the way down and innervate muscle of your left toe. And if you want to move your uh, right finger, that impulse originate in the left hemisphere. Um, and um, if it's a rubrospinal, for example, so it's a part of extra pyramidal, it does not originate in the cerebral cortex. This one originates in the midbrain, right? It's a decussate, goes down, uh, synapses with interneuron and synapses with your muscles. Uh, remember all those extra pyramidal um, 
constructs are for uh, kind of coarse movement and um, movement that um, pretty much you do automatically. Uh, you still move your skeletal muscles, but you don't really need to think, uh, think about it very often. Like for example, keeping your posture balanced, keeping your balance, you don't always like, okay, let me contract this muscle, let me relax this muscle. It's it kind of done for you by your brain and it's done through this extra pyramidal tract. Okay, um, so now the last part of this uh, PowerPoint, uh, uh, some diseases and um, uh, homeostatic imbalances of the central nervous system. Traumatic brain injuries include concussion, temporary alternation in function and contusion, permanent damage, subdural or subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, that's blood, when blood leaks from uh, ruptured blood vessels, either under dura matter or underneath uh, your arachnoid. Um, and um, this may force brain stem through the foramen magnum, resulting in death. Cerebral edema is swelling of the brain associated with traumatic head injury. And on a diagram over here, you see the venous sinus. Remember, that's a blood vessel. And here you have a blood vessel that is ruptured and blood start leaking out. In this situation, it's still in subdural space because that's your dura uh, and that's underneath the dura. So it's a subdural hemorrhage. In this situation, you have blood vessels uh, accumulating in subarachnoid. So it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Cerebrovascular accident or CVA, or what you call stroke. Blood circulation is blocked and brain tissue dies. So if blood circulation to the brain tissue is blocked, that means your brain is not receiving any blood. If your cells do not receive blood, they die. All right, so why do we have this blocked circulation? Maybe it's a blockage of a cerebral artery by a blood clot, and then we call it uh, ischemic stroke, or it can be hemorrhagic stroke when we don't block the arteries, but we have a rupture of a blood vessel. So you can see here, either we have blockage inside blood vessels and this area of blood does not get enough oxygen. So it go to ischemia first. Ischemia means low oxygen level and then it start dying. Or we can have a rupture of blood vessel if you have rupture of blood vessel, you have bleeding and this part of brain dies as well. Typically leads to hemiplegia or sensory and speech uh, deficits. Um, that's our CVA stroke, right? Uh, we have TIAs, it's transient ischemic attack. It's a temporary episode of reversible cerebral ischemia. So when, uh, when the blood vessel, uh, when the uh, brain is without um, oxygen for a short period of time and it's reversible, then the function uh, can be uh, restored. So tissue plasminogen activator or TPA is the only approved treatment for stroke. Okay, so now why uh, why we mentioned TIAs over here? Because um, sometimes patient will have several TIAs before it get into severe CVA or stroke. So that's the sign that some blood vessels might be blocked um, or might be maybe small uh, hemorrhages within brain, and that might lead to a uh, um, stronger attack that can lead to uh, permanent damage, right? Now, also, I forgot to tell you that if you forgot what hemiplegia is, it's a paralysis of um, 
of one side of the body only. So for example, only left side of a patient is affected or only right side is affected, not entire uh, body, but um, half of a body only. Um, gen uh, degenerative brain disorders include Alzheimer's disease, AD, it's a progressive degenerative disease of the brain that results in dementia and degenerative means that just brain cell just dying. Um, Parkinson disease, also degeneration of the dopamine releasing neurons in the substantia nigra. Um, so it's, a, it's found in, a, this is a part of your brain. Um, and you can see that healthy neuron over here release dopamine and dopamine has a receptor. So it's a, a result in a normal um, propagation of nerve impulses. But uh, in the people with Parkinson's disease, uh, they have decreased amount of dopamine. That means they do not activate uh, neurons and movement is affected. You know, people with Parkinson, they have uh, tremors and they have problem initiating uh, movement. Huntington disease is a fatal hereditary disorder caused by accumulation of the protein Huntington that leads to degeneration of the basal nuclei and cerebral cortex. Now, cerebral cortex obviously on the surface of cerebrum and basal nuclei are just below the cerebral cortex. Um, spinal cord trauma, um, in, uh, functional losses can lead to paresthesia, sensory loss or paralysis, loss of motor function. And um, here are some uh, symptoms of paresthesia, uh, tingling, numbness, um, crawling itch, can cause pain, can cause skin sensitivity. Um, so when spinal cord is damaged, and you know, spinal cord is like two-way uh, street. It's like a road that goes uh, two directions, towards the brain, sensory information, and away from the brain to the muscle, motor information. So it can be either sensory, um, some sensory loss or motor function loss. Uh, paralysis is the loss of movement. Um, we have flaccid paralysis, then impulses do not reach muscles. There is no voluntary or involuntary control of muscles, and it causes muscles atrophy. Uh, spastic paralysis, when we have damage of the upper motor neuron or, or of the primary motor cortex. Um, so upper motor neuron is located in your cerebrum and axons moves down the spinal cord. And then they synapse with the low motor neuron that activates your muscles. So when only upper neuron are damaged, then you don't have voluntary control of the muscles, but you still have reflexes. So your muscles are actually activated by a spinal reflexes. They stimulate it. That's why it's caused in a spastic paralysis. So muscles are not flaccid, they contract it, but you cannot control them. Spinal cord trauma, transsection is a cross section of the spinal cord at any level. Now look, that's what important to remember over here. When you have transsections, it results in a total motor and sensory loss. And like you would never believe it, but like 80% of students when they have this question, they only talking about motor control, paralysis. You know, I think that's your prior knowledge. You know, if somebody damaged spinal cord, they paralyzed. But I want you to remember that it's not only paralysis, it's also paresthesia. Because it's not, your spinal cord is not only for motor control, it's also for sensory control. So if you have cross section of the spinal cord, right, you lose both you lose your motor control and sensory control. And transaction means you just sever your spinal cord all across, right? Now, if this 
cross section is in a cervical region in your neck, then it will, it will be quadriplegia. If it's in a cervical region, that means that all your body below neck is affected. Quadra means four. So all four limbs are affected, arms and legs. If transaction between T1 and L1, so not in the cervical region because cervical is C, right? So T is thoracic or lumbar, then it's paraplegia. That means that only uh, legs are affected, thigh and leg, and it can be of body below the arms, but patient can still have sensation from the arms and movement in the arms. And of course, again, um, like if it's cervical, it's quadriplegia. Um, so no sensation of movement in uh, arms and legs. Now quadriplegia, sometimes called tetraplegia because tetra means four as well. Now if in a thoracic area, um, like um, the um, large amount of the torso is affected. So there is no sensation and movement in torso and both low extremities. Uh, when you move further to the lumbar or sacral or coccygeal, you have um, the uh, low limbs only affected. Okay, so paraplegia and quadriplegia, a little bit more about these conditions. The cause may be trauma sustained during a car accident or a health problem such as a stroke, loss of movement, loss of uh, or altered sensation, including the ability to feel heat, cold and touch, loss of bowel or bladder control, and uh, exaggerated reflex activities or spasms, difficulty breathing, coughing, or uh, clearing a secretion from the lungs, not curable, but by using a range of treatments and management strategies, it may be possible for some people to regain partial control over the affected area. All right, so that's our quadriplegia and paraplegia. Okay, so that this that was the last slide in this pretty long PowerPoint, but um, you know it just a touch to the central nervous system. Um, this is kind of introductory lecture, and um, of course I'm recording lecture for community college students, so we're not going much into details, but I think this was interesting, and it was helpful. Thank you for watching and I talk to you again in my next video lecture.